giving a talk about uh, real time, and probably the first thing some of you would notice, uh, it's written Erwin Erkinger. This has a reason. Well, the reason is um, the slides are prepared from my brother, and uh, he's supposed to be here, but he must work for his company, and so I have the pleasure to introduce his slides and yeah, my talk. <laughs> um, accidentally, I know also a lot of real time, so it shouldn't be the problem here. OK. Uh, let's start with the obvious first question. What's real time, and uh, what's the difference between uh, concurrent and real time programs? In in the beginning of the software development, uh, there were sequential programs. Like uh, everybody remembers these big, uh, huge uh, mainframes. They were just able to make one thing after each other. And uh, so the execution is predetermined, and the results are independent of the execution speed. This is quite easy to, to catch the figure. And uh, also, it's quite nice, you can uh, often analytically verify of the correctness. Concurring programs, uh, well, um, this is the typical situation of the today's operating system. They execute uh, multiple programs in pseudo-parallel. I mean, pseudo-parallel is like, it, it seems it's parallel, but uh, uh, it's not parallel, of course, we have one CPU, so the CPU must uh, give a time slice to this process and then give a time slice to another process. And uh, so we have the feeling of parallelism. But uh, as today's uh, operating system try to be quite fair, um, it will happen that some program gets a specific amount of time and afterwards the operating system looks at it and says, well, okay, there is another uh, low priority task that hasn't got uh, a time slice for quite a while, so why not give them the next slice? This is quite good and uh, in most of the situations it's comfortable. But, um, for instance, the results of uh, concurrent execution is dependent of the execution speed. I will come to this later, but it's not like sequential programs, and uh, it's not like real-time programs, because um, in real-time programs, there is a, um, a deadline, and each real-time operating system satisfies this criteria, giving a task after an event uh, occurs within a deadline, a guaranteed uh, reaction to this event. I mean, doesn't sound to something special, but let's have a look at it a little bit uh, in detail. So, as I've said before, real-time programming guarantees the reaction on an event before the deadline. Real-time isn't necessarily fast. Uh, most of the times, real time has the, is like 
real time and embedded and fast. And no, real time just means there is an event, and before the deadline is reached, there is a reaction. Every time, not most of the time, every single time. Uh, the time limit, of course, depends only on the application. For instance, um, the time limit for um, switching a railway, uh, the, the embedded device for switching two railways to each other could, for this device, real time could mean three seconds. So actually, it's not very fast, three seconds. But it, it means it's satisfying if the reaction occurs in between three seconds. Uh, in automotive industry, so with cars, modern cars have plenty of computer stuff inside. Uh, this could be 10 milliseconds or less, depending what this device is doing. So, real time means the computer reacts in time. Okay, we have different uh, types of real time. Um, of course, the obvious hard real time, hard real time will never fail. I mean, um, in soft real time may fail, fa uh, fail and, and will. Uh, for a typical um, example of soft real time, look at your mouse cursor. If you move your mouse, you see the mouse cursor moving also, and most of the times it behaves like this. Sometimes it flickers and the computer does something more important in, <laughs> in his opinion. And yes, then it fails. But um, I, I mean, in case of a mouse cursor, it's not that catastrophic. But uh, for hard real time, imagine um, a meteor, a comet and uh, you have a device where you want to take photographs when a meteor or a comet uh, is touching the air surface. So you have a, a trigger, and um, this is just a box which says, OK, wow, here it is. And then, then you have the photo, photograph unit, which gets this event. And this is where hard real time comes in. Uh, if the photograph box doesn't react within the deadline, you will miss the shot. I mean, there are other uh, examples of real time, like um, moving a car. But um, in case the, the difference between hard real time and soft real time is Hard real time will not fail. Soft real time may fail and will. OK, uh, for soft real time, as I've already mentioned before, you can use your operating system. Mouse task is a typical soft real time task. Um, well, for hard real time, you need something more specific. You need a real-time kernel. Um, most of the times, uh, real-time kernels uh, are associated with uh, embedded systems. But um, embedded isn't real-time, but most of the times, embedded devices. For instance, your DVD player at home has a real-time operating system. You probably your uh, digital television receiver, if you have one at home, uh, it's a real-time system. And so embedded is a, a special purpose computer system, which is completely encapsulated by the device it controls. 
Nothing really besides this is special on an embedded system. It's just fit into a special purpose. It doesn't uh, mean that it's fast. Uh, it's just as fast as it has to be. So real time, that's the good news, can be achieved on every computer system in, in, with the appropriate means like um, what is your deadline and so let's see how we can achieve this deadline. Okay, um, to begin, to become a little bit more detailed, uh, as, a, as a forecast, we, we will have a look at the Linux RTE kernel extension that is a uh, Linux um, real-time kernel on top of Linux, of course. <laughs> and uh, so the problem is that uh, Linux is a typical concurrent system. You have no deadline guarantees. You have uh, especially uh, people who, who use the Linux uh, for audio uh, performances would notice uh, you have strong variant of execution time. This is ex especially if you do something with audio quite bad. And so how to be real timing of Linux? Okay. Um, you have the tasks which are going to, ge to get executed. Um, the, uh, the scheduler is that part of the operating system which is uh, supposed to do that. RSR, ISR is the interrupt service uh, dispatcher and the interrupt controller, of course. So how we put real time? on top of it. Basically, we take uh, the interrupts, the events, which get fed from hardware, and replace our interrupt scheduler with our real-time scheduler. There we have our real-time task, which uh, completely independent from the normal tasks. And of course, Linux is running uh, as one low priority task in the real-time system. Okay, um, how can we do this? To know how we can implement a real-time uh, program, or hack our D digital uh, television receiver, uh, we must know some few things about what is a task. I mean, a task uh, in this context. A task is an independent threat of execution. It, it may contain uh, functions or uses functions, but the task is not a function. It may be synchronized, and uh, of course it will most of the times communicate with other tasks. And in case of real time, it may be non-preemptible, preemptible or time sliced. It may be uh, non-preemptible means nobody, also the operating system, is allowed to interrupt this task until it's finished, or it gives away the time slice by itself. Preemptible is the opposite, means okay, you can interrupt me. And time sliced, we will come to this later, is a, um, a specialized thing in real time you, you do when you have no interrupts. I mean, um, this, 
We can do this later. OK. Uh, <laughs> a task has, of course, a priority. Everything is based on this priority. It's not like the, the Linux nice level. It, 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 serves a, it serves a similar function, but the, the priority is, is a criteria if a task gets scheduled or not. It has some states, of course. Most important ones are blocked, ready, and running. And it's maintained by the real-time kernel. So basically, a, stack, a task is an endless loop. It blocks if it wants something from outside, I.O. Yeah, it's set up by an init function. Uh, in case of RTI, you insert the kernel module. This is the start of life on the, of a real-time task. And it's made of the, so the, you see the task is made of disk data. Uh, this is the data segment, the code, the stack, and some uh, real-time operating system internal uh, task control block. Of course, uh, what's in this task control book? Most of the time there is, um, of course, the ID, the ID of the task, sometimes the priority, but uh, it's mainly um, business of the real-time operating system, what's inside. Okay, let's go to scheduling. As I've uh, said before, a task can be preemptive or non-preemptive. And um, periodic or not periodic. Periodic tasks, as you see in this picture, gets involved every fifth time slice. Uh, in my, uh, this is a little bit, it's actually, this is a little bit simpler than it actually is, but for, I think uh, it, it explains the picture. Periodic task, like I've said, time sliced before, you see the periodic task gets involved every time the time is over, and uh, so it interrupts the preemptive task, runs a little bit, and then gives back control to the preemptive task. So, as we see around 10, there is another high priority non preemptive task. Yeah. And uh, the periodic task, therefore, gets involved a little bit later. Depending on the timeline, this is a good or a bad thing. <laughs> so the interrupt service routine is one of the core concepts, one of the important concepts of a real-time system, because um, basically it, it's the function where you get control out of order, which means Interrupt occurs, um, you can react to it, or the real-time system can decide to ignore it. But um, the interrupt service routine is a very small part, uh, part which just looks which interrupt happened, What's the current state of the system? Um, will it return to the task after the interrupt? And, uh, well, what priority is the task currently running? And then decide what to do next. So in case of real time, we have a task 
We have an interrupt service routine. Okay, now we are, we are able to react on external events. We have the possibility to activate or disactivate the task. But uh, right now it's a little bit boring <laughs> because uh, we have no way of communication, we have no way of synchronization. So this is where the message queues comes in. And message queues are for intertask communication. Usually, uh, in real time, you're using fixed length data. Usually in, in real time, you do as much, much as possible at uh, design time. This has a reason because uh, you want to get this system deterministic. The more you know at design time, the better it will actually go. <laughs> so fixed length, it sounds, sounds like, uh, so real time is really, um, you must know what you're doing. <laughs> okay. So in a few minutes we will have a winner for what a um, Okay, so the message queues. In Artile Linux, we have every flavor of message queues you want. We have mailboxes, we have queues and pipes. In other systems like Pesos, Pesos is an embedded real-time system mainly used in consumer, consumer uh, environments like DVD players. Probably you have one at, at your home. But um, common to all this implementation is you have a, a maximum size of elements which can, can be queued. And you can use this message queue for sending data. So, but, um, so I'm, I'm wanting to sending data to the screen. Well, uh, in this example, you see two tasks. Um, one simple, something nice to display to the user, but uh, the results aren't that nice because they each get a little time slice and, well, that won't work. So we need more than message queues, we need semaphores. Semaphores is a principle, um, it's, like, um, it's like a token. Uh, in, in the history, on railway tracks, there were, on, on, on parts of the railway tracks, there were only one railway. So how to, and you know, Telegraphic uh, communications wasn't that good at this time. So they had the problem how to not to crash two trains into each other on this single line. And of course this was easy. They used the token uh, at the last station before it went to one line. There was a stop and Either the officer had the token there, and the token was given to the, to the train uh, operator, and with the token, the train operator crossed this part of the railway, or he has to wait until the token arrives. So you are passing tokens. As soon as you have the token, you are allowed to use one device or whatever you want to use. So here is our token and task one and task two in this example 
both want to get the token. Well, task one is in this case faster. Um, task two gets a message, well, uh, your token is not available and it blocks. So task one prints hello world. Task one gives the, this token back and unblocks and unblocks task two, which can then print good evening. And then, of course, like every good program, it must keep the semaphore back. So semaphores are used for inter-task control communication. You can protect your resources with it. Uh, depending on the implementation, there are counted semaphores. There are some, I think I can imagine some examples where counted semaphores are useful. Most of the time, so you don't need it. Um, if you want to take a semaphore and you are out of luck, this will block your real-time task. Um, of course, um, you have to give it back. Sometimes in, 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 in case of uh, inter-task control communication, um, you are speaking of mutexes. Um, basically, it's a semaphore. It's just a, it's slightly different, but in, in this case, it, it's the same. So, okay, what, what else do we have to have an working real-time operating system. Of course, we need a timer. Um, single shot events or periodic events. Sometimes the timer is the only interrupt which is allowed in a real-time system. Then you're doing uh, something from top button. You say, I don't care about hardware interrupts, I don't care about whatever device wants my attention, I just use a periodic timer, uh, and this is my only source of interrupt, and this is time triggered, as I've mentioned before, and um, in case you know exactly at what time you must react or not, it may be the, a clever solution than having hardware interrupts because it's not a matter of uh, how quick or how uh, efficient your processor is used. Yeah, also real-time programming doesn't mean you're using your processor efficiently. It, it's not, I mean, yeah, <laughs> uh, you should do with the processor what you want and uh, you should have sufficient power to do it. But um, real-time systems, most of the times, is designed to be utilized not more than 70%, and it will be utilized uh, at 70%, even if it does, does nothing, uh, almost nothing. The rest of the, th uh, the rest, like the 30th percent, are only for unexpected, non-deterministic behavior, uh, especially if you try to make real-time on a uh, architecture like the x86. Um, you need uh, quite a lot of buffer because it's quite non-deterministic. Um, so the time is a, one of the most important uh, devices when it's going to go about real time. It's used for delaying, it's used for waiting, and um, yeah, uh, if you wait for something, it blocks, of course, and 
Yeah, and, uh, another thing that uh, will, will make uh, real-time programming a little bit more comfortable, you have uh, user kernel space communication, because R-Type, uh, the tasks, as I've mentioned before, are placed in kernel mode. Uh, that's good on, the one, on one hand, and you have a libc, a specialized libc, that uh, life is a little bit easier there. But uh, most of the time you just want to do a specific task in real time and make the rest of the calculation, the rest of the presentation or whatever in user space. And there you can use whatever library you want and, or use unreliable transport mechanisms like TCP IP. So, for this reason, our type provides a FIFO, that means a, a serene buffer, basically with first in, first out, and a shared memory access for user kernel space communication. So, uh, I think we now have the basics of uh, real time programming. We have tasks, we have mailboxes, message queues, I mean data, which can be sent from one task to, an, to another. We have the semaphores, which we use to control the, control the data communication, to control uh, reaction and reservation on external devices. So, sounds easy, but... Um, there are some more obstacles. Uh, I mean, we have enough of the APE to do something useful, but uh, there are obstacles. And one of the typical obstacles, uh, you will have to face is priority inversion. And uh, usually a real-time task never gives time to a lower priority task if there's a higher priority task ready. So waiting for execution. So basically priority inversion should never happen. But if in this example you see there is a resource and uh, task two takes this resource. Then there is some periodic event of another real-time task. And task one, which has a higher priority, uh, is executed at around six. But task one needs a resource currently reserved from task two. And therefore, it must block and uh, let task two finish. And uh, well, between, you see that the area of priority inversion, there are lower priority tasks being executed uh, of the real time kernel because the, the higher the priority task cannot get this resource. So usually priority inversion is something you get when you're making design flaws, like uh, messing around with uh, resources used by different tasks, not... Um, um, there is an example, actually, a very nice example. Uh, <laughs> um, a tank. A tank uh, was uh, had uh, some kind of priority that the real-time control software of the tank had some typical uh, example of priority inversion, and um, the screen there there was some debug output, and uh, the first of the how you call this this these things on a on a tank where it's moving. 
I mean the, the, the chain, yeah. The chain is connected to two, mo uh, to two uh, engines, front and rear. And the two engines, of course, must run synchronized. And uh, in case of the tank, the chain broke because uh, the engines were running out of sync because one of the engine was starting, then the other engine, of course, should start in a, in a, before the deadline is reached. And the first engine was writing something to the screen. And exactly at, at, at this time, there was a periodic event where at the screen there is written the, the time of the day and, and some temperature stuff. And actually, the screen, the, the, the screen functions were very bad written. So um, the screen task was actually uh, crashing and didn't give back uh, one semaphore, I mean, uh, waiting. The, the task, which was responsible for displaying the, the time and the current temperature, was cra uh, did crash. Uh, therefore, it didn't give back the resource, uh, the semaphore of the screen, and therefore the, the second engine couldn't start because uh, it couldn't get the screen, so it blocked and the chain simple <laughs> fall in uh, small parts. So this was very uh, complicated to find because at first they had no idea what happened, and then they figured out, well, every time um, there is something in movement and there is this temperature display, something bad happens. And <laughs> this is called priority inversion. So priority inversion is bad, but it's a, a design flaw and you should avoid it quite easy. So another uh, pitfall before I finish, is a typical deadlock. You know the philosopher's uh, problem? You have four philosophers, and left of you is a fork, right of you is a spoon. And um, yeah, you take, you look if it's something left to you, you take it. And then you look if it's something right to you, you take it. If not, you wait until it's there. If um, all four philosophers make this, well, they won't eat anything. So the task block because of mutual uh, reservation of resources. Again, um, system design. You can avoid this, but uh, for instance, in this case, you must uh, have a look. How can we solve this with one semaphore? You have two semaphores here for each philosopher. I mean, you have four semaphores. For each fork and spoon, you have one semaphore. But you could solve this with two semaphores. Yeah, and here's the... Um, the explanation why time trigger systems sometimes make uh, make sense, because uh, in um, high load situations there is something called um, uh, interrupt storm, and of course every interrupt takes a little bit of time, and uh, if you use two, if you have for a certain event tons of tons of interrupt. You have something like an interrupt storm, and uh, this could lead to situations where nothing goes on at this point because the system just serves acknowledging interrupts. You can fix this if you just use time-triggered slots and then look, oh yeah, okay, my one I.O. resource was just behaving like wild, okay, well, forget about it and look at the other things. So, um, 
time triggered has a, usually you give away a little bit of performance, but uh, you can avoid high load scenarios. Okay, as I have begun my talk a little bit later, I must skip the last part. But uh, of course, uh, what is uh, in security uh, situations where real time is used in cars or in aeroplanes, um, you have some additional protection. And um, this also involves that the system is checking if everything is really in time within the deadline. I mean, because when we are talking about the deadline, uh, it should never occur. But uh, in case of uh, a car or in case of an airplane, it's still good to verify this. So. <laughs> Uh, you have some additional timestamps on each message. You have additional timestamps on each task that is that to check if it's in between the deadline or not. Uh, the tasks, of course, are separated from each other. Uh, most of the time in real time, especially RT Linux, you're all in kernel space. I mean, that's a lot of fun, but... Uh, <laughs> you, you could do to other tasks whatever you want, and uh, in case of an aeroplane, it won't be that good idea. So they have uh, additional protection features. And um, yeah, fly-by-wire is one of these typical uh, examples which we can use for additional protection. Uh, also, in this case, you always use fixed times, time slices. You trash everything about interrupts. You don't need it. You need fixed schedules. And uh, if you want to, to do something uh, in real time, probably you could start using Arta Linux and uh, getting one of these uh, shiny uh, digital television receiver cards and uh, play a little bit around because uh, you could possibly attack the encryption of the television broadcast uh, with a real-time task. Uh, everything else would be uh, would fail, of course. Uh, probably you will fail too, but <laughs> in... Uh, uh, if you use real time, you have at least a chance to react to the decoder card within the time limit. And so the show goes on, and you have an additional chance to decode it. So, real time is more or less in uh, many devices you have at home. Real time is very common in, in your electronic devices all over. And it's not that hard to use, but uh, yeah, remember, real time means to react within not reaching the deadline. So to be real time in this talk, I must finish right now. <laughs> <laughs>